It's always a good day when I get to talk about one of my favorite telescopes. And it's the Celestron C9 and a quarter. This is an internet favorite telescope. It's sort of a cult telescope. And I first saw one of these about 20 years or so ago, and I think my first reaction was nine and a quarter. That's sort of an odd aperture. I mean, Celestron had an eight and they had an 11, and Mead had an eight and a 10. So nine and a quarter didn't really seem to uh, correspond to anything. But these things quickly came to reputation for being really, really good. And this is my probably my favorite schmidt cassegrain of all time. So just for size comparison, yeah, I know, it's kind of hard to see me here. We have several schmidt cassegrains We have a 6-inch, we have an 8-inch, the 9 and a quarter is at the end here, and here's a 10-inch. Now, as you can see, these telescopes get big, and they also get quite heavy pretty fast. So... The weights, as you see here, that's, this is the way you would use the telescope. The 6 is about 9.5 pounds. The 8 is 14.5 pounds. The 9.25 is 23 pounds. And the 10 is 32 pounds. Think about that. You're only getting an extra 3 quarters of an inch of aperture with the 10. And it's almost 8 or 9 pounds more than the 9.25. Okay, so we've removed the six inch and the eight inch because I want to show something between these two telescopes. Now the nine and a quarter has been available for many, many years and they've sold it with many different mounts, including lightweight equatorial mounts, the mid-class CG5 AVX class mounts, and even larger mounts than that. It's also been available as a, an alt as CPC version, and this is actually what this telescope is. This optical tube was taken off of an alt as mount, and they put a plate on the bottom of it so they can put it on a conventional equatorial mount. So there have been several versions of these through the years. Uh, they're all good. I don't know if one is any better than the other, but some of the early versions may have been white. Um, the rumor is that the white ones were Japan destination models, and some of those have mechanical digital counters on the visual back for your focuser, and some collectors like those. Now, some of these are black tube, some of these are gray tube. Again, I don't know as if any of these are any better than the others. So we can address this issue of, is the nine and a quarter actually any better than a conventional schmidt cassegrain Well, I don't know. I, could, I know that I've never seen a bad one of these. And again, I just think this is my favorite schmidt cassegrain um, I've heard some uh, explanations as to why people think the nine and a quarter is so good. And the most common one you hear has to do with the primary mirror. Now, in most conventional schmidt cassegrains the primary mirror functions at somewhere around f2.0. The primary mirror on the C9 and a quarter is said to operate somewhere around f2.0. 2.3 to 2.5. It depends who you listen to. By the way, if anybody's actually done that test, please leave a comment below so we can all know about that. I'm curious about this. So if you've ever made a mirror, you know that uh, the slower mirrors are easier to make well. And it, the difference between f2.0 and f2.3 doesn't sound like a lot, but it's enough that you could probably get a little more of a consistent quality out of the mirror. Now, as a result of the slightly longer F ratio, uh, you can see that the aspect ratio of the nine and a quarter is slightly different from that of a conventional schmidt cassegrain like this one. Um, it's longer and thinner. If you notice, they're about the same height, but the C9 and a quarter is thinner. And if you hang around telescopes enough, you'll start to recognize these things out in the observing field, even from a distance and sometimes even in the dark. Um, and again, is this an urban myth? I don't know, and by the way, I can tell you, this 10-inch mead that I have here is one of the very best telescopes I have. It has outstanding optics. I'd put these two side by side and say I, it's, it's a tough call between the, the two of them. And we're here with the Schmidt Cassegrains all mounted. We have the 6-inch, the 8-inch, this 9 and a quarter, and the 10-inch. Yeah, the 10-inch isn't mounted. I ran out of mounts. So as I said before, this is a really good telescope. The star test is excellent. There's really not much to talk about here. And in fact, all of these are really good. 
I think if I were to single one out as being slightly less good than the others, it would probably be the six at the end there. It's not that it's a bad telescope, it's just that optics aren't quite as good as the others. Ironically, that's the one that stayed with me the longest. So if you buy this nine and a quarter and it didn't come with a mount, your first major decision is what kind of mount are you going to put it on? And if you look around, you're going to see lots of different debates and disagreements as to what is the proper mount for this telescope. And there's a good reason for that. This is sort of an in-between scope. I don't know that I would call this a small telescope, but I don't know as if I would call it a big one either. It's sort of in-between. So as a result, you can put this on a number of different mounts. You could put this on one of these mid-size mounts that I have over here. This is an AVX and this is a CG5. Now, they used to sell it this way, and I've done it myself. I don't know if it's a perfect solution because I'm finding it's a little bit top-heavy uh, and teetery for my taste, but you can do it if you want to keep your rig as small as possible. So I have this one mounted on a Celestron CGE. They don't make this one anymore either, but you can find them used. It also appears to share at least some parts with Lausmandy's G11. So if you have a G11, it's going to look very similar to this rig here. Now this CGE is a little bit overmounted for this telescope. Um, I kind of like it that way, but there is a mount in between the midsize and the CGE. In Celestron, it's known as a C-GEM, C-G-E-M. I'm not sure they make those anymore either, but you can still get it as an Orion Atlas. I believe Skywatcher has their version. Uh, Ioptron, you know, take your pick, pick your favorite. Now, the reason I bring this up is because whatever amount you choose, it is going to have some implications for you in the future. For example, the mid-size mounts take the narrower Vixen-compatible plate like this. The larger mounts take this D plate, which you see the 10-inch mounted on here. It's more than twice the width, and the CGE has the D plate on it. So. Uh, whatever one you pick, you kind of kind of be stuck with it for a while. Now you can change them back and forth if you want. It's a little bit of a pain. You're going to be spending money for you know plates and radius blocks and so forth, but you can change back and forth. And you can also get an adapter. I have one here. This takes it from the D plate to the narrower Vixen compatible plate inside. Now I don't have the other adapter that goes the other way, which is that you can take a smaller plate and then mount the D-plate scope on it. Uh, I don't know that that's a great solution. Once you have a scope on a D-plate, it's probably going to be a little bit big for one of those mid-size mounts. So as you can see, Schmidt Cassegrains are easy to collect. And at one point, I actually had all of the currently available Celest Celestron Schmidt Cassegrains. I had the C5, the C6, the 8, the 9 and a quarter, the 11, and the 14. And on my website, I posted a silly picture of me surrounded by all of them. And of course, it was one of the dumbest things I've ever done because pretty soon people started emailing me, Ed, you have so many of these. Would you please sell me your, you know, whichever one they wanted? And within a period of only a few months, they all left me except for the six. That's the only one that's still available from that picture. And I remember of all of the ones that did leave me, it was the nine and a quarter, I think, that bothered me the most. Uh, I met a guy in a, saw, in a friend's driveway, and I took the scope and the mount out of the car, and when I saw just how happy he looked on his face, uh, I knew I was making a mistake. I just didn't want to hand it over. So if you do get one of these, especially if you get one with a mount, you're going to be ready to go. Typically, they sell this with everything that you need to get started. But if you do get a complete stock unit, there's a couple of accessories I would think about changing. And the first one is this visual back. This is the interface between the telescope and your diagonal. And they have been selling these things with these little chintzy inch and a quarter visual backs with one set screw in them uh, since the beginning of time. And I really wish they would just change them out and start using two inch visual backs instead. Uh, they look like this, it's just, a, it's just a two inch tube is all it is and it threads on and it's going to set you back about $40 or so, but trust me, it's going to make your life a lot easier. I'll have all of these converted over. None of those have the original inch and a quarter visual backs on them. The second thing I would get, and I'm still surprised today that I get emails from beginners on this topic, but you do need a dew shield of some kind. So the dew shield slips on the front like this 
And the reason you need it is because there is a corrector plate right in the front here. And when you bring your telescope out on a warm, humid night, it's going to do over and cloud over pretty fast. In cold climates, it's going to frost over pretty fast. And then you're done often, sometimes within even a few minutes. So I've got dew shields for all of these telescopes I keep in a, in a collection. And it's something you want to invest in. So is this telescope for you? I like it a lot. Now, before you pull the trigger, even if you have your heart set on one of these, there's a couple of things you should know about as to what this telescope won't do. And it has nothing to do with the telescope itself. It has more to do with your lifestyle, your expectations, and what you want to do with the telescope. So the first thing is at 2350 millimeters, the focal length is getting to be a little bit long. And with the lowest power eyepiece that I typically use, which is this 35 millimeter panoptic, you're looking at about 73 power. So what this telescope won't do is really low power. If you're the kind that likes to look at, um, you know, big sweeping vistas of the Milky Way, you want to see the whole Andromeda galaxy, you want to look at the whole Veil Nebula. Um, as I film this right now, there's a really nice comet out, Comet Neowise. This is late July 2020. Um, this telescope won't show you all of those things because the magnification is sort of starts at mid-power and gets higher from there. So some observers report that it feels a little tight or claustrophobic or boxed into middle to high power. Now, there's a couple of ways you can get around this. And the first thing you can do is you can just buy a smaller wide field refractor. A lot of people just do that. And I have a number of 80 millimeter refractors around here that I use for those purposes. So if I want to see, you know, that whole comet, I'll just break out, you know, an 80 millimeter F6 refractor, put that same 35 millimeter panoptic in it, and I could see many, many degrees of field. The second thing you can do is you can get one of these things. This is a focal reducer, and it screws in between the visual back and the diagonal. And what this does is it reduces the focal length by 0.63. So your F10 telescope becomes an F6.3 telescope, which is good for photography because things are faster. So the second thing this telescope won't do, as you can see, is it won't be light or small. I, I've got it on a slightly bigger mount than most people might put it on, but let's go ahead and wheel this guy out of the way. All right, so now we have the 6, the 8, and the 10, and I'll show you the difference here. On the 6 inch, I usually leave this thing assembled in the garage and it's right near the door, and if I want to pick this up and go outside, it's not that bad. I just pick the whole thing up. So the 8 is a little bit heavier. I don't have a problem picking this thing up. It's a little bit heavier, and if you notice from the weights before, the 8 is only about 5 pounds heavier than the 6, but you have to keep, take some other things into account. The 8 is going to require the 11-pound counterweight as opposed to the 7-pound counterweight. So there's an extra four pounds there as well. The eight is probably more likely to have a two inch diagonal and eyepiece in it. And the eight is also likelier to have a larger finder attached to it. So all those things start to add up. You wanna take those into account. Now the nine and a quarter on the CGE, there's no way I'm picking this thing up. Yeah, I know you wanna see me try, don't you? The mount alone weighs 117 pounds. Uh, in fact, the counterweight, this counterweight I weighed at about 24 and a half pounds. This counterweight alone weighs as much as some entire entry level equatorial mount. And this rig is close to 140 pounds. So if I want to take this thing outside, it's got to go out in pieces. And when I'm done, it's got to come in in pieces. If I'm driving it someplace, uh, it's got to, that's an extra takedown and setup cycle that I have to factor in. So it's not so, so much the telescope, it's what you have to do to get it out there that has an effect on how often you use it. And there you have it, one of my favorite telescopes, the Celestron C9 and a quarter. And again, just be aware of some of the issues I described earlier. And I'll also put in an additional plug to try one of the smaller ones out to see if you're gonna be happy with it um, as opposed to a larger telescope like this one. You know, I'm seeing a lot of this lately where people will buy a telescope and then try to fit it into their lifestyle. And I think what you probably should be doing is closer to the opposite. Examine what your lifestyle is and buy the telescope that fits into it. And that may mean that you buy a telescope that is different from the guy next to you. 
And that's fine. There are no right or wrong answers here. There's only an answer that works for you. So there you have it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.